morning, uh, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, about a framework for ev ev <coughs> if even myself, I cannot pronounce my title, it's uh, bothering. Uh, a framework for electroencephalography based evaluation of user experience. Uh, this work uh, is on behalf of my uh, co authors, Maxime Daniel, Julien Castet, Martin Haché, and Fabien Lott. Uh, this work was done in INRIA Bordeaux in collaboration with Immersion uh, Company. So, first, a uh, bit of, of context. So I'm part of uh, the Pochok team, which is an HCI uh, team, and uh, we develop new way to interact with uh, computers. So I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room to do so. So in Pochok, we develop new interfaces, for example, to interact uh, in a 3D environment, to navigate in the city, or we can also try to um, use uh, the physical surroundings to display information on, sheet, uh, on sheets of paper, or we could also try to use tangible interactions and spatial augmented reality to interact with uh, everyday objects. So there's uh, one question that we ask ourselves when we do develop new uh, HCIs. It's uh, how uh, to decide if a new interface is uh, better or not than the previous ones. In order to answer to those questions, we have several evaluation tools uh, at our disposal. Uh, usually we can uh, use like inquiries, uh, questionnaires, interviews, or we could also measure uh, the reactions of the users. So we can have behavioral measures. Uh, we can measure, for instance, uh, the time it takes to complete, to complete a task. Uh, the problem is that with these uh, evaluation methods, there are some issues, uh, for instance, uh, with inquiries, you distract users, so you have to stop uh, usually the task in order to ask uh, your questions. And also, you have only uh, delayed and sporadic measures, so the measures are not continuous. Uh, you have, uh, if you uh, ask questions uh, 15 minutes after the, uh, the experiments, then you have uh, a data point uh, every 15 minutes. And as for the behavioral measures, uh, then uh, if you measure like the number of clicks, uh, the speed, the accuracy, you cannot uh, grasp many dimensions of the user experience. It's hard to really sense what the user is experiencing. So uh, to solve these issues, uh, recently it has, it has been advised that we could use uh, physiological signals in order to get uh, continuous measures, in order to get measures that will not disrupt the uh, interaction, and in order to, measures, uh, to measure at the same time various dimensions of the user experience. So we can measure, uh, for example, heart rate or breathing patterns, or we can also uh, record brain activity. So uh, as uh, Natalia, uh, in our lab, we have been using uh, this kind of uh, setup, so electrodes that you put onto the scalp in order to measure brain activity. So there's, uh, of course, many other uh, ways to measure brain activity, including some more invasive techniques. So you could put electrodes directly onto the, the brain, but be reassured we won't do that today. Uh, so this technology is called EEG, electroencephalography, and it records the electrical currents onto the scalp. So as you have seen in the two previous talks, uh, there's one uh, issue with these techniques is that basically the raw signal it's a mess. You cannot just record EEG and hope to measure uh, the user experience you have uh, to make some signal processing in order to extract meaningful information. So briefly, uh, I will present the three main uh, features that you can extract from EEG. Uh, the first one is uh, the spectral features. So for instance, the raw EEG signal is the combination of uh, many uh, frequencies. So if you filter the signal, if you apply a bandpass filter, you can extract these frequencies and we have some knowledge about which uh, frequency is linked to uh, which particular uh, neuromarker, so to some states of the users. Uh, then we can also have like uh, temporal features. So if I produce a node stimuli, like this one, if I clap my hand, it's likely that it will induce some kind of peak within your brain activity, and this is another feature that we can measure. And uh, finally, we also have uh, spatial features uh, so uh, we know, for instance, that uh, some parts of the brain are linked to some uh, cognitive uh, states. So for instance, if we want to measure uh, high-level cognitive states, we would rather put the electrodes on the front, uh, over the frontal lobes. So uh, now we uh, know how to uh, process EEG, and what can we measure thanks to that? Well, uh, if we take uh, like a simplified uh, representation of an HCI, 
If, for instance, we are interested in the user, with EEG, we may uh, measure several constructs. So, for example, uh, if you uh, take like a workload, which, which is the amount of cognitive effort you put into the completion of a task, so it's very similar to like physical uh, load. If you want to lift heavy weights, uh, you will have to put uh, much strength into it. And uh, as for mental tasks, it's the same. If you have to solve complex problems, you will have to put uh, uh, more uh, mental effort into this completion. So if you measure workload, then you will be able to sense the efficiency of your system. Uh, if you're rather interested in the interface, uh, maybe you would want to measure the error recognition which is uh, uh, the fact that the users uh, detect uh, if the system reacted poorly or not. And if you measure that, then you would have some kind of uh, sense of how, how intuitive your uh, HCI is. And finally, uh, for example, if you're interested in the content of your uh, HCI, you may want to measure emotions in order to sense how your uh, interaction affects uh, the user. So we have uh, all those various dimensions and all together, it can give you a pretty good uh, uh, vision, view of the user experience. So uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about uh, workload. Uh, and uh, in order to, so you have a new interface, and then you want to uh, measure workload out of it. So uh, what are the steps uh, that you need to uh, under undergo? Uh, first, you have to create uh, your application. Uh, then you want to uh, make sure, if you want to validate, uh, as we do, if we, if we want to validate that EEG can indeed measure accurately workload, we have to obtain a ground truth and we have to make sure that our new interaction, our new application, uh, induce several levels of workload. Then we want to teach the computer how to discriminate uh, different workload level. And in the end, if we are ambitious, and spoiler alert, we are, we will try to use uh, these uh, recordings to compare at the same time several interaction techniques. So here is the uh, application that we uh, created uh, in order to test uh, EEG as an evaluation method. It's a 3D uh, maze. So basically it's a kind of a game and you control uh, a character in the maze and you have to learn a sequence of, of symbols. Uh, so here it's the uh, easiest condition. You have only, only two turns and you have the choice between only left and right uh, directions. So uh, of course uh, we can increase the difficulty. We can increase the speed of the character because the character is moving forward automatically. We can increase the length of the maze and uh, because we are evil, we can also change the orientation of the uh, surfer. Indeed, uh, the surfer is like a futuristic surfer and its board can stick on the walls and on the ceiling. And if the surfer goes on the ceiling, then because the controls are mapped uh, to the point of view of the character, then all the controls will be inverted. So when the surfer goes on the ceiling, if you want to go uh, right, you will have to press uh, left. And this creates uh, this kind of uh, hardest level where you have only one second to react, where the maze is longer, it's like uh, four turns, and where all directions are open. And also, as you see, uh, sometimes the surfer just randomly stick to one wall. So you have to update your frame of reference at ev basically every turn. So believe me, this level is very difficult. Uh, so we, uh, we tried to induce several levels of workload and we wanted to make sure that indeed it, uh, it does produce uh, various uh, and dis dis distinct amounts of workload. In order to check that, we use uh, commonly used uh, questionnaires, which is the NASA TLX. So in a pilot study, we had users uh, doing the levels and we asked them questions such as, if, uh, such as, not this, not this button. Ah, it's all black, sorry. Okay, I must have pressed uh, that button. Huh, quite troublesome, I would say. Okay. Press P. Press P for black. Yeah, P for black. You think so, really? No, it was B. Okay, so here was a not stimuli, so I think maybe I induced a peak within your, uh, within your brain, and I think also in mine I was kind of... Uh, all spiky. Uh, okay, so we uh, we got this um, we these questionnaires, 
And then uh, we asked questions such as, was the task easy or demanding? Uh, how much time pressure did, did you feel? Or how successful uh, do you think you were? And we had uh, this kind of results. So in fact, here, we validated that indeed we created four different uh, levels of difficulty uh, with increasing workload, which was induced. So now we have our uh, application, and we want to teach the computer how to uh, discriminate uh, the various uh, workload. And in order to do so, we used a standard uh, task used in psychology, which is the end back task. Uh, basically, you have to remember a sequence of letters. In the easy condition on the bottom, you just have to react to the letter you currently see. And in the hard condition, in the two back task, you have to remember to decide whether uh, the uh, character you currently, the letter you currently see is the same or not as the one you saw two steps previously. So you have to keep in your memory constantly like uh, two or three letters and you have to update this memory uh, all the time. And this task induce, it is known that it, it induces uh, more workload. So we use that to teach the computer how to discriminate a workload. So if you remember the first presentation of uh, Natalia, it's kind of a passive BCI uh, paradigm. Uh, so for those uh, who love uh, numbers, uh, we use the five frequency bands. Uh, we have been using spatial filters in order to uh, reduce the complexity. And the interesting number is uh, this one. It's, that it's la the classification accuracy. So on this validated task, uh, we obtained a high uh, classification accuracy. So now we have our system trained, and we want to test our uh, application, the application that we developed. So uh, we applied uh, the knowledge of the system onto the recordings that we made uh, during the, the application. So here we tried to uh, transpose uh, the knowledge gained during a simple task to a realistic and complex task, uh, something which is uh, rarely done in uh, EEG uh, studies. And we obtained this kind of results. So first, you will see that the workload index measured with EEG uh, is uh, as, as with the questionnaires, you see like an increase. So as the level of, diffi of difficulty increase, the workload index increase. And also we manage to uh, differentiate, differentiate the workload between the keyboard condition and the touch condition. And we uh, saw that uh, using a touch screen uh, induce more workload. Uh, in fact, it was expected because it's really not intuitive to press, remember, when the character is upside down, you have to uh, invert the controls. And using a touch screen, it's really not intuitive to press on the screen left in order to go right. So then you would say, wait a minute. You said that the EEG it was interesting because you would gain uh, continuous measures. And here, you give us results which are basically the same as the one you could get from questionnaires. Yes, you would be right. And in fact, with EEG, we manage to get continuous measures. So if we take only one subject, and this is uh, like the uh, output of our system for one subject over the whole experiments, then we would see that, for instance, when it's uh, low, uh, like uh, an easy level which occurs, we uh, measure a low uh, working workload index. And when the highest uh, level of difficulty occurs, then we measure a high workload index. So here, we validated that with EEG, we can, uh, you can apply this to any of the HCI that you are developing. And indeed, without, uh, modi without modifying your current uh, software or tools, you can have a continuous measure of workload. And then you would say, wait a minute. You said also that EEG is awesome because you can measure uh, several uh, dimensions of the, of the user experience at the same time. And you would be right to tell me so. And in fact, in this study, we also measured at the same time not only workload, but the attention level of the subjects and the error recognition. So up to which point the interface was intuitive or not. So I will not detail uh, those results uh, now. You can uh, look at the paper if you want to, uh, to know more about it. But at the same time as we measured workload, we did indeed measure uh, various dimensions of the user experience. For instance, uh, the attention level of the participants and their uh, error recognition. So uh, EEG could be really a, a complementary tool for evaluation of HCI. Uh, however, there are some uh, limitations to uh, overcome. Uh, first, we have to make sure that we uh, do uh, make uh, reliable measures. 
So we have to be wary of uh, some artifacts, such as uh, muscular artifacts, artifacts when we measure uh, EEG. And we have to use the proper calibration techniques. Also, EEG is not uh, like the perfect, the, the ultimate brain recording uh, device. It has flaws. Uh, for instance, it possesses a low uh, spatial resolution. Uh, and also, if we want to foster the use of EEG uh, within uh, like the community, we also have to rely on more uh, affordable uh, hardware. So, for instance, uh, I've been using like uh, hardware uh, like the GTech, which, co which costs uh, 20,000 euros or dollars. Uh, but nowadays, there's cheaper alternative which uh, comes uh, on the market. Uh, for example, I've been using this kind of uh, open source, open hardware board, the OpenVCI, and I kind of uh, hacked myself some uh, ninja style uh, EEG uh, headband <coughs> that I used in order to monitor workload. So if you want to use uh, EEG for evaluating your HCI, uh, then all the details are on the paper. I'd be happy, glad to help you. And also, uh, you can do so without uh, spending too much money. So if you want to recruit someone, uh, it would be uh, easier. So little recap, EEG uh, has been validated as a complementary evaluation method for HCI. Uh, I've presented here a framework for uh, monitoring workload, attention, and error recognition. But in my team, we also did some work about visual comfort with stereoscopic displays, and we already managed to uh, like gather some dimensions of the user experience. Uh, before I conclude, I will shamelessly uh, make some self-promotion. So uh, you could like have a takeaway message, or you can have a takeaway uh, PhD graduate, aka me, because I defended uh, recently. So uh, I'm looking for postdocs, and also uh, I do not do only uh, like evaluation with physiological sensors. I'm also really interested in how exposing inner states could change our social relationships. And for that, I have a poster that I will present still um, tomorrow. So at the next breaks, uh, come and see me. And uh, I, would like, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, notably Maxime Daniel, who did an incredible work uh, on, the, on the maze. And I thank you for your attention. So thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Inky Kim from University of Virginia. So I have a question about the difficulty of your task that yeah. you're controlling. It's kind of confounding uh, the difficulty of increasing the increasing level of difficulties of cognitive function and um, perceptual motor tasks kind of combined to get together, right? So uh, uh, how would you say in general, like uh, the impact of increasing motor uh, difficulty versus like cognitive difficulty and th this impact on EEG, how do you say the general trends of that? Uh, I'd say that you would need maybe, so here we really we use like the NASA TLX in order to really measure more cognitive workload. We use the, uh, some specific items, but if you want to measure some specific uh, dimensions of the workload, because workload is also vast uh, compound, then you would need uh, to uh, select uh, over calibration tasks in order to do so and to really pinpoint another questionnaire. So here we were like interested in a more broad uh, workload index, but indeed there's various dimensions that you could also try to specify. Hi there, good, good talk, uh, good. happy to be here. Um, my name is Horia from Nottingham University. Um, I was very curious um, if you can talk a little bit about um, the attention it yeah. was interesting how it decreased as, as the levels increased. Yeah. Uh, so in fact, this attention, it's like a particular kind of attention. It's the attention toward external stimuli. So in fact, we produced uh, during the, the, the game, there was uh, stimuli, audio stimuli. So for instance, when I was clapping my hand, it, wa it was exactly like that. There were random sounds, and we measured this kind of peaks within brain activity and we detected less peaks uh, on the uh, hardest level of difficulty. So this kind of like, uh, like attention is really uh, the attention toward external stimuli. And there's, of course, like uh, more focused attention or vigilance. There's also, as in workload, there are various components that you could try with other uh, like experimental paradig paradigms to analyze. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, nice talk. Quick question. Have you thought about uh, going beyond measuring just high, medium, low, and different types of workload, intrinsic, germane, extrinsic? Um, they all have different, uh, yeah. Uh, so right, right now, uh, no, because it was really like the, uh, the objective was really just to validate EEG first as an evaluation method. But indeed, uh, if you are interested into this kind of, again, uh, specific dimensions of workload, uh, then you could do that. And with, uh, with again, uh, some more specific, uh, like another task, calibration task, uh, some specific applications. So maybe you would try not to change at the same time, like the orientation of the surfer and the length of the path, but maybe you would just tune one parameter at a time. And then I, I guess I would say that it's the same uh, pipeline that you would apply in any case. And that is described uh, in the paper. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you.